Welcome to Kitty Talks. We share inspirational life stories that inspire you to create yours. And today I have with me a very powerful uh, energy healer. Jerry, welcome. Hi, Kitty. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, for those of you that don't know, Jerry Sargent is a transformational energy healer, and you're about to hear an incredible journey of transformation. But, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us this, this afternoon. It's a pleasure. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And we've just had a quick chat and um, we're um, really excited about this conversation because I think you're going to hear a lot more about what Jerry is up to in the world and the impact that he's having, positive impact he's having on the planet. But Jerry, for the listeners, could you just tell us a little bit more about your work and what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, so I'm kind of just traveling a lot at the moment, all over the place, really, and um, running workshops, uh, training people to heal using I don't like to call it a healing modality um, because I don't like to put things in boxes and have systems, but I suppose it would be my healing modality, which we, which I call star magic, which is something I've kind of developed and remembered and rediscovered after a crazy old journey through my life. So I'm traveling around at the moment, running meditation workshop, um, running retreats to help people remember how to use star magic not teach people because i feel that i can't really teach anything i can just help people wake up the innate and natural abilities that reside inside of their own genetic makeup you know deep in their dna so i'm traveling around running these workshops writing books um you know doing all sorts really and my my, my primary purpose is just to help elevate consciousness on this planet and and do it through love, unconditional love. You know, that's the, the key message really for all of my work. And it's uh, it's about returning back to who and what we truly are at the core of our beings. And that is light, sound, energy, information. And, you know, that ripple that runs through all of that is unconditional love. And we need to remember to, to love each other, love ourselves and, and just walk around this planet with zero judgment and just accepting everybody as who they are on their own individual paths and with the work that I'm doing with star magic I'm connecting people to that frequency of unconditional love so that they can know their own power because I don't want people to walk around this planet not knowing how truly incredible they are and every single one of us is completely and utterly unique special magical we've all got so much strength and wisdom locked inside of us and when i do the work that i'm doing i'm helping people connect to this frequency and they're discovering who they really are powerful light yeah wonderful and um you know we touched on this earlier and i truly believe that we are more powerful than we've ever been taught you know from birth you know we are incredible energetic beings and by the sounds of things your work is helping people get back in touch with actually you know what they're capable of absolutely rediscovering their power so they can become free you know, freedom's a big thing for me you know so many people walk around this planet locked in the matrix working a nine to five taking orders fo following a set of rules and regulations that they've been spoon fed since the day that they were born and 99.9 percent .9 of these rules and regulations don't serve the human beings that play this game of life and they serve a chosen few. And I want people to wake up so they can realize that they can make a choice mm -hmm. and they can change the rules that they're playing. They can create a new set of rules, a, rules, a set of rules that serves them and their fellow brothers and sisters that are running around this planet. And it is a game, you know, it is a game. And we've got to realize that we shouldn't take it too seriously. We should have lots more fun. And, you know, we should work less. We should create more, mm -hmm. and we should love more. and you know, just play the game how we want to play the game. And that is, for me, it's a, it's a game where we kind of crumble the system that we, where we, we've got that's locking us up at the moment and create a new way of being on this planet where we care, where we share, where we love, where we're kind, where we're compassionate. And we're not thinking about me, we're thinking about other people and how we can all, you know, interface together as energetic beings, living in these avatar or these human bodies, you know, 
with the animals that are around and the trees and the wildlife, you know, we're all interacting together and we've just got to know that at the core of each of us is an energy source and it's the same energy source. And, you know, if I look into your eyes, you're no different from me, you know, and, and, and the next man or the next woman, we're just, we're just light manifested into human form playing this game and we're all the same. Mm. We're all love. And that's what it was down to. It keeps coming back to love. Wherever you look, wherever you turn, it's just unconditional love. It's light, it's energy, it's sound, it's vibration. Wonderful. And, I, you know, we're totally on the same wavelength because obviously through these interviews, you know, we're, our vision at Kitty Talks is to inspire a generation of change makers to follow their passion and purpose and make a difference on the planet. And like you, show people that they can live a different way and they, don't, they can do, follow their passion, follow their love and create a life that's in alignment with their soul. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I, I say to everybody, if I can change, you can change. I mean, I was a criminal, you know. I mm. Tell us a bit about your story. Um, I mean, I was, uh, I was fostered, adopted as a kid, um, grew up as a very angry child, um, played rugby as a child to kind of vent my emotions and my anger, ended up getting banned from rugby when I was about 14 years of age. And then turn to drink and drugs. That was my answer. You know, go out, get drunk, you know, pop a few ecstasy tablets, get my whistle and my horn and travel around the English countryside, you know, going to raves. You know, the rave scene was rife when I was a kid. So I was just with my friends, you know, partying like crazy. And, you know, I thought this was just going to be the rest of my life at the time. I thought it was wonderful, you know, not a care in the world. Moved out of home at a young age. And, um, you know, I kind of messed up my school and I went to a grammar school, an all boys school, which was, you know, apparently a really good school to go to, but it didn't really disturb me at all. I just kind of rebelled really as soon as I got there. And then when I was at partying, um, during that time of my life, a couple of my mates died, one in a car crash, one from a drug overdose. And I thought to myself, you know, I need to get out of this situation or I'm, I'm either going to end up in prison or, you know, maybe dead. So I was blaming my, my environment, you know, everyone was to blame apart from Jerry, you know, Jerry was just this kind of innocent, you know, human being that got wrapped up in it all. So uh, a, a chain of events led me to Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And my plan was to get away from England and away from all of the bad influences. But when I got to Tenerife, I ended up jumping from the frying pan and into the fire. And there was much more drugs easier to get hold of the influences around me were kind of a much higher level in terms of danger and and the criminal fraternity and I ended up working for a high profile criminal organization um started off like with a lot of fraud like selling timeshare and then moved into drugs um gun running and then uh, into human trafficking trafficking men and women wow. it's quite a big jump <laughs> yeah and then a lot of like um, sort of white collar crime, like um, bank fraud, you know, which which I was really good at, you know, all of that stuff. I mean, I I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was earning loads of money. It, I was a young age, didn't have a care in the world, you know, no children. So yeah, I was just kind of just traveling around um, Europe, making loads of cash and just living the, what I thought was really the life of my dreams at the time, you know, I didn't have anyone to answer to. I was hardly working many hours. It was just money just seemed to flow into my life. And that's all I cared about, was fast cars, gold watches, you know, nice clothes, you know, going to nightclubs and drinking and all this sort of stuff. And that was my life. Um, and then I met uh, a lady um, who was my kind of future wife-to-be. We had our first child together. Um, around that sort of time, uh, one of the bosses from our company got arrested, put in prison, and then a big sort of like gang um, sort of turf warfare started, people getting stabbed, shot, killed, put in prison. And I said to my missus, you know, we've got to get out of here because, you know, it's not just me anymore, it's you guys too. So we decided to move back to England. Um, but my uh, future wife to be at the time didn't have a passport. And she was from Romania. So she, when she left her country, she kind of like snuck out of her country. And um, when we got well, when we had our daughter, Alea, um, she couldn't get a passport either because my, my because Laura didn't have a passport. So mm -hmm. I had to smuggle Alea and Laura back into England. So my kind of like criminal skills kind of came in a little bit handy there. Um, so we got them back to England. 
got married in England. Then we set up a property business. Um, we made millions doing that. And I was kind of turning my life around, getting away from what I was doing. And then the property business went uh, went tits up. And we kind of lost everything. We went from having millions um, to having pretty much nothing, getting kicked out of our home within the space of a couple of months. And I remember going to my mate's house and borrowing 50 quid to feed the family. Mm. And uh, you know, going from having like sort of, you know, Lamborghinis and an office with 60 staff and loads of houses to having nothing to borrow money. It was a big jump. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, because shortly after that, I had my first spiritual experience. And... Um, yeah, it kind of sort of sent me on a different path, really. And I, I was so, so kind of material driven at the time. All I cared about was, you know, feeding my ego. I just wanted everything material and I was never satisfied. I just wanted more. You know, one car wasn't enough. Three cars weren't enough. Six houses weren't enough. Ten houses weren't enough. And I was so, going to say, like, looking back on that now, can you, would you say that that was what's happening? You were living totally in your ego. Oh, big time. Yeah, big time. You know, I was... I really didn't care who got in my way. I was if someone got suffered, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, because of my actions along the way, for me getting what I wanted, you didn't care. It just kind of was like water off the duck's back. Um, and now, when I look back on it all, you know, I just, I'm not. I don't wish that anything hadn't have happened. I don't I have no regrets at all. I'm glad it all unfolded the way that it did. It was part of my journey, but it. it it buckles my stomach up. It makes my t- stomach churn when I think about how I used to be. Mm. That's what I am now. So, yeah, this experience happened. We got kicked out of our house. We ended up renting to, like, a, a house um, in Surrey. Um, and this is where we had, a, you know, it was my first spiritual experience, in which my ex-wife was involved in um, as well. I was watching TV one evening, and she came downstairs, and she looked really worried. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, well, every time I, hit, I, I close my eyes, I hear all these dark images. I see all these dark images and hear all these dark voices. And I was looking at her thinking, yeah, that's a little bit weird. Sounds a little bit strange. And um, I, in the end, I said, you know, what do you want to do about it? And she said, well, you know, I want to phone my friend. So she phoned a friend that was a priest. We had this priest come around our house. She started putting up um, like crosses, like she was dousing the house and all this stuff. And I was sat there thinking, this is nuts. This is like something out of the poltergeist. Yeah. So anyway, she's calmed Laura day and Laura's gone to bed. Next day, I've gone to see a mate of mine. And I've said, listen, you know, this really weird thing happened last night. And I said, what do you make of it? And he said, you need to phone this lady. So he gave me the name and the telephone number of the lady. I didn't know who she was. She lived the other side of the country, but I gave her a ring. She didn't answer and she called me back, you know, a little while later. I explained the story. And she asked me where I lived. And I said, uh, 316 Richmond Road. That's all the address I gave her. Yeah. And she said, hold, hold on a minute. So I'm waiting on the phone like this. And she says, have you been knocking any walls down? And I said, no, we actually rent the property, but the previous owner has definitely built an extension. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got an angry old man in your house. And I'm thinking, an angry old man? What are you talking about? She said, yeah, you've got an angry old man. So I said, okay, well, let's pretend there is an angry old man in the house. What am I going to do about it? She said, well, I'll get rid of him for you. I said, brilliant. When are you going to come down to London and, and, and get rid of it? And she said, oh, I don't need to do that. I can do it from here. So I'm thinking, this is just getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> so anyway, in the end, uh, we parted company on the telephone. I went home. I spoke to Laura. And I said, listen, I spoke to this lady about what happened last night. And she reckons there's an angry old man in the house. And Laura turned around to me and said, yeah, I know. I've seen him. <gasps> so I thought, okay. You've seen this angry old man. There's a lady who lives, you know, the other side of the country. She's telling me there's an angry old man. You've got no common friends. There must be some kind of underlying truth to this. So I phoned the lady back up and said, I don't know what to do, but I want to come and see you. So I went to see her and had my first past life regression. And I was hooked. And I went every week um, and then started going twice a week and then three times a week. And I went, wow. for, and went into hundreds of other realities which I now know aren't really past lives, they're parallel. So I just discovered so much about myself. Um, I was involved in a remote, in, uh, remote viewing incident um, around the same sort of time where I had everything that I saw, um, everything that I saw and was validated by Scotland Yard. So that gave me a lot of confidence in what I was kind of seeing and feeling and knowing and you know, seeing these other realities. And then I had an encounter um, with a reptilian whilst I was... Um, 
at a meeting in a house in Surrey. I went to a talk about 2012 and this guy was giving me and my mates a talk and some other people that were there. And I asked him a question and he turned around to me, uh, looked at me and his face disappeared. And I was just face to face with a green lizard thinking, what <laughs> the, you know, and inside I, you know, I was burning up but on the outside. I was trying to keep, calm, you know, cool and calm and collected, but that happened. And then wow. shortly after that, I had, um, I was in a car crash in Romania. Um, where yeah, tell us about, tell us about the car crash, because that just sounds incredible. And I'd love for you to describe, um, because obviously one of the things that we talk about here is, you know, being in alignment with your soul. And obviously, so I'd love for you to describe what happened in the car crash. Yeah, the car crash, I think, was probably one of the most profound experiences that I ever had. Um, I was asleep in the passenger seat of a taxi. Hmm. And... The taxi, well, it, it was going along. It was like early in the morning, and I woke up and I heard the loud crash. There's, there's glass everywhere, there's wind everywhere, the car's swaying from side to side. And I, in my mind, I think, boy, we're in a bad accident. We're either going to hit the oncoming traffic or the car's going to flip over. And then all of a sudden, we came to a stop. I've looked at the taxi driver to my left. I've looked in the back, and our daughter, Alea, is climbing out from underneath the driver's seat. Laura had our son Josh in her arms. Josh had been born by then. He was, I don't know, six months old, uh, maybe a little bit older. And both their mouths are full of glass. I've looked in front of me and there's a big hole in the windscreen. And um, there was no other cars on the road. And my head, there was blood running down my face, but it wasn't my blood. And what had happened is the taxi um, had hit a lady um, yeah. on that was crossing the road in the morning. And she came through the windscreen, smashed me in the face, then got sucked up and flipped over the car. The second lady that was crossing the road had her ankles cut off, and the third lady was physically okay. So I've got out of the car, I've walked up the road, I've seen these two ladies, uh, the one with her ankles cut off. There was a man on a telephone who had come out from a nearby factory, so I thought, you know, we must have called emergency services. So I just walked past him, and I was fixated on this lump on the floor, which looked like a dead body. I've walked towards it. I've got closer and closer and closer. And I got within about 10 meters. And I've seen this lady's soul just hovering above her body, not with my mind's eye, but with my with my physical eyes. Like she was there in this 3D reality, this like transparent energy stores just hovering above her body. So it was like time just stood still. I've got closer and closer and closer. And this this soul just kind of really slowly fizzled off into the ether. And then I'm looking down at this lady, her legs are wrapped up over her head. And it reminded me of someone taking an old car to the scrap heap. Like the soul had no longer any use for this body. It was mm -hmm. like, well, I'm out of here, guys. And boom, it had gone. No love lost, no emotions. Just it had gone on its merry nice way. Job. Yeah, it had done its job. You know, the vessel, it was useless now. It was completely obsolete. So it just left it. And that's what it looked like. This, this mess just left on the floor. And it really kind of hit home to me that we're just light, we're energy, we're, we're, we're so much more than our physical bodies. Our physical bodies are nothing without our consciousness, our spirit, our soul, our essence. Mm. So it's like the universe just smacking me around the face and saying, come on, Jerry, wake up. You know, you need to get a grip, son. You need mm. to you know, realise what we are at the core of our beings. And it was a few months after this that uh, my, my wife had a headache. And I thought to myself, if I could take it out of her head, I don't know why I thought this, but I just did. And I've walked over to her, she's lying on the bed. I've put my hand on top of her head and I saw the headache, it was green. I've just grabbed it and just pulled it out of her head. And she got up off the bed like she didn't have a headache. And I thought, you know, that's a little bit weird, but I didn't really think anything else of it. And then a little while after this, uh, we moved to New Zealand and a friend of mine had a serious car accident. And her partner phoned up and said, Jerry, can you help? And I was like, well, how am I gonna help? You know, I'm in New Zealand, you're in England. Uh, but my intuition just said, go and lie on the bed, get your crystals and lie on the bed. So I put crystals on my different energy centers, lay on the bed. Then all of a sudden I was inside a hospital room and all of this light started pouring out of my hands. And I kind of just knew what to do. I started putting her body back together. And I did this, you know, every day for a couple of weeks. And she walked out of hospital with a Zimmer frame in 12 weeks. And the doctors had said to her, you know, you might not ever walk again. You'll be in hospital for at least a year. And do you think that accident was a catalyst then for these kind of higher energies to come in and through? Or how do you explain how the healing uh, power came in? You know what? I, it's, I don't really know fully. I think what happened is 
it was a trigger. Like I was in such a, a deep, dark, dense, like three D space in my world that there's no way that I could just be shown something minimal, or that, you know, something you very subtle. Really. I needed a big smack around the face, and that's what I got in the car crash. Mm. You know, and to see that spirit and see that soul, have the experience with the reptilian, to see it with my physical eyes, like all of the experiences I had. I didn't see with my mind's eye. They were there in my space with me. It was something that I couldn't not. Yeah, I've had the same. In my mind's eye, I might have thought, ah, it's just my imagination. Yeah. But there was no way that I could knock any of this stuff. And and when this lady came out of hospital, I was thought, you know, thinking, is, is this my imagination? Did I really help her in this situation? But when she came out of hospital, she phoned me up and she said, Jerry, I woke up one night. I looked at the side of my bed and said, what are you doing here? She saw me. You know, I was in New Zealand, but she saw me in her hospital room and started speaking to me. So I started to realize that all of this imagination stuff is actually reality in a different vibratory space. Mm. So I started exploring a bit more. And a, a, an old guy that I met, he had a pyramid in his garden. And I used to go around every day and, and meditate in it. And I had some amazing experiences in there. Um, like one day Jesus appeared before me um, and all of my, both my feet, they turned to boards of fire. And he said to me, Jerry, you can walk wherever you want to go. Don't be scared. So that happened. And then these steps appeared by the side of him and he walked up the steps and I followed him up the steps and through a door. And we were in the Last Supper. And I was Matthew and I was looking around. Jesus has given his Last Supper sermon. There's all these other people, there's loads of food. And I've looked out of the window and there's a massive extraterrestrial craft. And they were kind of just showing me, you know, um, the extraterrestrials have been around for a long, long, long time, way before human beings. And they've always been there, some supporting us and some kind of, you know, a bit more uh, malevolent and not supporting us, more trying to control us. So I had this experience. And then a couple of weeks later, I was meditating in the pyramid again. And a little space pod, the only way I can describe it, came and landed next to the pyramid. And I was meditating with my eyes open. My eyes weren't closed. I saw this thing and I've gone and jumped inside of it. And there was a being inside of it. Like it was hard to tell how tall it was until we got to where we were going to. But we traveled through this tunnel of light and it lasted maybe three, four, five seconds. And then we came out of the other side and we were hovering above a beach. And we were on a planet in the Alpha Centauri star system. I don't know how I know this. Yeah. But I knew yeah. all this information when we got there. And when I got out of the space pod, there was loads of beings. They were like six and a half, seven foot tall. They had no hair. They were blue, but a little bit gray, but kind of mostly blue. They were androgynous, neither male nor female. They had no clothes. They were, look, they were very athletic looking. And they all came to meet me. And it was like going home. I felt very emotional, just full of love, full of peace. Uh, very kind of teary at the same time. And I followed one of them. Uh, the, 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 the beings not on the beach, they kind of opened up and formed a tunnel. I followed one of these beings and they took me into this light structure. And it was like a building. And when I got inside of it, there was like this elder there or their chief. It's the only way I can describe it. And I knelt down on the floor and this big orange download of light started pouring into my crown chakra. And it had lots wow. of like code in it, geometry, uh, hieroglyphs, but none of the hieroglyphs and geometry that you kind of see in textbooks. I call it space geometry because it was patterns and shapes that were morphing and blending within the light and the, like, like different kind of code, which I didn't really understand. But this was pouring into my crown and then it kind of just stopped. I don't even know how long it went on for. And then they frog marched me back to the space pod and then boom, we were back in the, back in the garden and I was back in the, in the pyramid thinking, did that really just happen? And you know? since that point, has your healing um, strength then got stronger? Because that to me sounds like it's almost like they're downloading information and they're like a channel for you, are a channel for that energy. Yeah, well, no, no, nothing, nothing happened for two years after that. And I was thinking, oh, okay. is, is all this stuff like what is going on? You know, like we, we set up a health and fitness center in New Zealand and it was going really, really well. And one day I woke up and I said to Laura and the kids, we've got to go back to England. And they looked at me like, like I was crazy. We've just gone to another country, we've set up a great business yeah. and now we'll go back. But I persuaded them to go back to England. Then when we got back to England, um, a few things happened. I was out running one morning and I saw some fairies flying around a tree. And I stopped and I'm looking at these fairies thinking, am I really seeing fairies? But they were there. And then an angel came down and the angel said, my name's Archangel Gabriel, you need to write a book. And I said, okay. And he said, it's called Into the Light. 
So I, I ran home and I just, this book just came out of me. So it was a book went into the like about my spiritual journey and lots of different things that I've learned along the way. And once I'd finished reading it, I realized that it wasn't about like, getting the message out there so much. It was about what was happening to me whilst I was writing this book and the frequency that I was being tuned into. And as soon as that happened, I started seeing all of this space geometry. And it was the same geometry that I downloaded in the orange light two years before on the planet. Yeah. So I was saying to my guys, what am I supposed to do with it? They said, meditate more. So my son and I were getting up every morning and we were meditating. We were going to the, these ancient mystery schools underneath the pyramids. And we were sat in a classroom and we weren't the only people there. There were loads of other people. We were sat at desks and there was a man at the front of the classroom and he was getting all these ancient scrolls and scribes out. And on these... Uh, scripts and scribes there were pictures and it was the same pictures of the geometry that i saw floating through the air same geometry that was in this orange downloaded light and they were showing us how to use this to heal people so we we, went, we got up every morning at five o'clock for nine months and went to this like these kind of cool. like, spaces these yeah. Schools, yeah. and um about, about nine months later people just started coming into my life that needed help so i thought well let me just see if this stuff works and it was working so I thought, you know, let's go to a mind, body, spirit festival. We went to one of those. I offered loads of free healings. Everyone loved it. And I thought maybe I can make some money out of this stuff. So I just set the business up. And as soon as I set it up, it just went whoosh. Um, the book came out of me. Um, we started training people in this stuff. It's just gone through nothing to everything really quick. And what, because obviously your path is incredible. Like I've had some pretty out there experiences myself, but not, not, reptilian or aliens <laughs> they're not having, they haven't come to me yet but for those people listening who are maybe not confused but they're not as clear obviously it sounds to me like this has evolved your journey has really evolved you were like given one piece and you were given the next so what advice would you have for people listening who don't necessarily know what they're here to do and how they can make a difference but they have got that calling inside of them you know if if i knew what i knew then like now then i would just say follow your heart you know your heart is like a compass and if you follow it it's always going to lead you in the direction of your dreams the one thing you shouldn't do is think too much thinking's dangerous you know we overthink we analyze and we end up like going in the wrong direction the best thing to do is to follow our heart just whatever we feel inclined to do move towards it it doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy road but just move and follow your heart and it will take you into the space where you can you know discover your life purpose your life mm -hmm. mission mm, that's beautiful advice i've been, you know i've i've started trying to think with my heart <laughs> you know that someone described it to me rather than feel with your head and then think with your heart so well, the heart is a brain yeah of course. it is a brain and if we can link the mind and the heart together which is something i always do with my work once the mind and the heart are intrinsically linked everything becomes easy but most people have attached the head and the, the heart is attached and they're just going in two completely different directions. They don't know whether they're coming or going. And that's exactly what we want to do with these interviews is it inspire people and encourage people and show by hearing, you know, your journey, your, you've just described what happens has happened to you when you have followed your heart is to give people that faith and that um, inspiration that they can do it too, basically. You've got to trust, you know, yeah. you've got to trust. You've got to trust yourself. You've got to trust your feelings and just go with it. And whatever happens, whether you follow your feelings and you think this was a mistake because something's happened, that's okay because you were supposed to learn that lesson to go on to the next stage of your journey. Just be grateful and welcome everything that's in your environment. Thank you so much for listening to Kitty Talks. Be sure to head over to our kittytalks.com website, become a member of our exclusive club, and you'll get free interviews and access to our private Facebook group, exclusive webinars, and secret success interviews. See you there.